Tick at one point, though, was literally about to get me to the point of pistivity, to the height of pistivity, when he starts to try to lecture Jiha about how he is treated in his own home country, how he is treated like the enemy in his own home country. And it's just like, nigga, you don't see what the fuck, you don't see any parallels here. You don't see any comparisons here. Like the cognitive dissonance is just very astounding. Like she's, he wants to sort of take a moment to sort of lecture her about America and how he's treated in America as he is helping the same American country that treats him horribly occupy another group of people's space and also treat them like the enemy in their own country. So he's treated like the enemy in his own country, but then he goes, <laughs> he goes just like Montos told him. And Montos told him about this a while ago. Are you really gonna go fight the white man's war? What up everybody, it is your boy Jabbar, the Kakashi Cowboy, and welcome back to my channel. I'm actually gonna do this video or this review of Lovecraft Country, this uh, sixth episode from my car, a car video. I'm gonna make this a car video because I actually am, I have class in a little bit. <laughs> so then I have to probably come back and actually do the other half of this video um, in my car. It's about this episode in particular, I think it's called Meet Me in the Daegu, um, and it takes place in uh, South Korea. And it's about the Korean War. From this episode of Meet Me in the Daegu, I really expected to sort of get Tick's perspective on how and what he went through when he was in Korea and how he sort of became messed up because I always felt like Tick was a little bit off to me. Tick just always seems very off to me. He seems to be kind of a little toxic in his male bravado and sort of masculine, to you know, toxic masculinity and always trying to like protect everybody and, you know, do the same things that kind of his father, like he would accuse his father of doing stuff of like, you know, uh, you know, doing things the wrong way and that he would also go about things the wrong way, not really being loving and emotionally available, um, just like his father all the time. <laughs> so Tick always always read a little bit off to me but I was wondering if we were actually going to get into why he became so emotionally detached you know when we got you know towards this episode of him being in South Korea this episode totally took me for a twist when you know essentially we don't get this from Tick's perspective we actually get it from uh, this Korean woman's perspective uh, her name is Jiha or Jia um, and she we first see her in the movie theater you know she loves American musical theater especially Judy Garland uh, and we also see the fact that you know American troops are coming in and occupying uh, their homeland hometown and country we don't really get a lot of narratives um, about you know the people who are being occupied we always get it from the from the perspective of the person who is doing the occupying and so I think that you know to sort of flip it from the point of view from the point of view from the perspective of Gia instead of a uh, tick I think that was also good. I think that was great I think it was good we see that Gia you know she is living with her mother you know I also found it very interesting about this uh, episode was that we we're sort of misled a little bit we kind of we were constantly misled we we're misled in the one way of like we're going to get it from Jihad's perspective instead of Tick's perspective and also the fact that we essentially we think that what you know Jihad is talking about is essentially cultural aspects of what she's dealing with and what she's facing in terms of the oppression of women in her country and what she's facing because she's constantly talking she's constantly being sort of pressured by her mother to sort of find a, find a man you know because they're kind of seen as outcasts and pariahs it's for some reason we don't really know exactly what at first um in this society and in this korean culture but they are and she, her mother feels um that she needs to go out and find a male suitor or at least that's what we believe until we actually see her get a male suitor or get men or go out and you know find men and it's actually to kill them instead <laughs> her whole sort of mythology behind jia is that you know her mother you know essentially uh her mother ended up marrying a man um, because she was also a social pariah because she had a child out of wedlock and so in order to sort of fit into society and the South Korean society you know she had to go and find a man but the only man that was willing to marry her was that of a pedophile and only want to marry her because of her daughter because he wanted to molest and rape her daughter and she actually you know put up with it for a while we come to find out that her mother put up with you know molesting and raping her daughter for a while until she just got you know I guess she over she she became overcome with guilt and overwhelmed with guilt that she ended up going to like a shaman or something and ended up you know summoning uh this sort of mythological beast 
um, that is known as the Kamiho, or as we sort of know it <laughs> in like anime and cartoons, Naruto. It's funny because my name is Kashi, and I got that from Naruto. And also in this episode, the you know sort of mythological creature slash demon that she summons into her daughter to sort of get back at her husband is sort of the nine-tailed fox but she summons you know the nine-tailed fox into her daughter to essentially take over her daughter so that the next time that her husband tries to rape her daughter that she you know will kill him because the nine-tailed fox in this sort of mythology is sort of like um, a succubus in a kind of way and it like consumes seduces and consumes the souls and the memories of men um and she like i guess rips her husband apart um we come to find this out through jiha as she is sort of talking about because i guess jiha the girl has completely sort of you know she's left the body she's not there anymore what is present inside this sort of flesh <laughs> flesh and bone body person is you know the nine-tailed fox and she's trying to figure out this nine-tailed fox demon spirit that is uh sort of occupying jiha's you know uh this mo mother's this mother's you know daughter the mother is also trying to figure out how she can make her daughter more human because she sort of turned her into a monster the shaman tells her you know is that she has to consume the souls of 100 men um she's at like 99 the last soul of course that she has to consume is ticks but she can't because she falls in love with him however before we even get to tick and gia's relationship she sort of has this relationship uh with uh, another woman i forget her name but it's sort of her friends also Sort of working to become nurses um and to sort of help and assist in the war and sort of help you know wounded soldiers and american soldiers that's what their task is um this woman that she meets in there they're always they're talking about men um a lot in there you know of course uh gia is a little bit she's not emotionally available um because she, i guess she still has that sort of demon essence inside her so she's not really emotionally available to be able to, to connect with men in that way or to connect on a human level with people in that way the girl that jiha meets is also a part of this sort of communist movement um and she constantly is talking to jiha about you know they shouldn't be you know uh you know persecuted or treated differently for being who they are and there was a real layering there she tells her this in the midst of a man you know that is being strung up you know and being hanged for being a communist and the american soldiers are just sitting by watching it because they're also in this fight because they're also trying to fight communism on behalf of white supremacist america and i really like the layering of it because they have these very intimate moments where they like touch each other's hands and each other's bodies it's not really in a sexual way but it's in a loving way that seems more than so than a friendship i actually felt like there was a layering there of also lgbtq rights and also being gay and also the idea of homophobia i felt like you know gia's friend was also even though they didn't really get to sort of expand their story and their storyline together there was a sort of an underlying tension of romance between gia and this woman or at least from this woman's perspective or from this woman's point of view you know towards gia she was interested in her you know uh romantically um and that she just sort of you know played straight you know with men and around the other women because that was culturally correct and she's giving the speech that is sort of layered on the fact that she is also like a communist sort of sympathizer i guess you want to say and she is also assisting the communists in their movements and she got they also get found out um this is where we finally meet tick um and he actually comes to the picture because for most of the, this episode we only get gia and sort of the cultural aspects of what's going on in Korea. Um, and then the Americans essentially get word that somebody from the camp, somebody from the nurses unit is giving out information. Of course it is Gia's friend, <laughs> um, but you know, we see not only the black soldier, you know, sort of yelling at them, intimidating them, waving a gun around, but he actually ends up shooting one of them in the face. He goes to shoot another girl in the face. He's run out of bullets, his bullets jam. Then we see Tick come in. He asks Tick, you know, to come in and Tick, you know, point blank, shoots the woman in the face 
And then they take, you know, the Jiha's friend essentially says enough, enough, because they're going to shoot. I guess they're going to shoot Jiha. And so she says enough, enough. It was me. It was me. So to protect her, you know, she turns herself in. They knock her out. We actually see flashback scenes um, when her and Tick are together, when Tick and Jiha are together and she's sort of consuming his soul or essence in a way. We see memories of him holding her down and while they sort of torture her and pluck out her teeth and pull out her teeth. I mean, in that moment where he's sort of committing acts of violence, we see Tick completely, it's like it's not even a person. I don't even know what the fuck that was. Like, he just, it was just like, it was a whole, it was a completely different person. And I really found it interesting that they have built up this character for us, our main character and protagonist, you know, for us to essentially somewhat like him <laughs> and all to, in the sixth episode, essentially make us hate him. <laughs> Because you just can't look at him the same after that. You know, he's completely devoid of human emotion when he's sort of helping, you know, hold Jiha's friend down and torture her. And also when he just shoots an innocent woman in the head, point blank, period, for no reason. We do get to see a little bit of his emotions and how this is tormenting him or a little bit um, when he is in the bed, wounded and injured himself. And Jiha sees him and she starts planning her attempt to sort of be her hundred soul that she's going to take. We we see Tick attempt to read the Count of Monte Cristo. I love the way that these little facts are coming back into play. If you remember, the Count of Monte Cristo was also his father's favorite book <laughs> that he that his father loved to read. That his father also used to escape, you know, the prison um, that he was being kept in or the jail he was being kept in at the Braithwaite house. If you remember that, so I love how these facts are coming back in. We see Tick in bed. He has a, you know, uh, his his legs are busted, his eye is busted, his lip is busted. Uh, struggle of war is really coming seeping into like his you know essence and into his being you know he talks about how he goes to sort of uh, stories to escape reality but he can't escape reality in that moment and he just throws the book across the room yeah sort of plans you know uh, his murder <laughs> to get close to him um to get romantically close to him to sort of open up to him so that she can sort of lure him in and be her, her hundred soul she ends up actually falling in love with him um they have they discuss you know uh you know, Judy Garland, they discuss, you know, uh, American musical theater, they discuss books, um, they start discussing the Count of Monte Cristo and how it differs from the movie. I really love that sort of inference right there, this idea that books, you know, that movies, <laughs> that movies meant, are meant for broader audiences, you know, they sort of, you know, whitewash, you know, the messages. He asks her, can she read the final chapter for him? And she sort of just goes based off of the movie that she saw, the American uh, um, movie that she saw of the Count of Monte Cristo and he's like nah that's not the ending um actually the ending is a lot better than the ending of the movie and all that other stuff so I like I like how that little inference goes into that this idea that you know the books you know the source material is better than usually the movie uh, or the film version because the film version is always built for broader audiences and the broader audiences you know kind of like a sort of whitewash not as harsh or critical looking aspect of the story and the character but, you know they sort of build a relationship Relationship. This is the one part that I felt was a little bit their relationship building. I felt like it went a little too fast. Like I feel like a lot of also other people felt the same way that no, <laughs> like it went like not that she can't. Um, it's not that she couldn't have fallen in love with him, but because of the time constraint that we're with. You know, it just seems like they bonded not over. It doesn't seem like they bonded for very long before they started, before she started having feelings for him. Um, and I felt like this should have probably been dragged over the course of two episodes instead of one. That way we actually get to really feel sort of a connection between them a little bit more than what we get. Because after somebody shoots your friend, somebody that you're really close to, and they, they seem completely to, you see them at their worst, like they completely go devoid of human emotion, almost like they're a robot. And like, then you just fall in love with them. The scenes that we see them bonding over, they're so few and so little. And like, it's just like, it's just not believable. <laughs> so even though it's probably over the course of months that they're bonding, we only get a few scenes where we see them actually interacting and bonding with each other over books, movies, and literature. And so it's just like, we need needed more time I think we needed more time I think it went a little too fast at the end but we have time constraints they're trying to fit a lot into these episodes that are like 45 minutes long each 
So, you know, they had to do what they had to do. The tick at one point, though, was literally about to get me to the point of pistivity, to the height of pistivity, when he starts to try to lecture Jiha about how he is treated in his own home country, how he is treated like the enemy in his own home country. And it's just like, nigga, you don't see what the fuck, you don't see any parallels here. You don't see any comparisons here. Like the cognitive dissonance is just very astounding. Like she's, he wants to sort of take a moment to sort of lecture her about America and how he's treated in America as he is helping the same American country that treats him horribly occupy another group of people's space and also treat them like the enemy in their own country. So he's treated like the enemy in his own country, but then he goes, <laughs> he goes just like Montos told him and Montos told him about this a while ago. Are you really going to go fight the white man's war? You're going to come back home and be treated like shit. You're going to go and fight some white man's war and, you know, oppress other people. Like, Machos tells him this, but he goes, just like most people do, most people do this all the time. People take their childhood trauma, and instead of going to go heal from it, going to go seek therapy, going to try to find peace and healing, they go and they just traumatize other people. So that's essentially what Tick really admitted to in this episode, that he really was trying to run away from his father and from the trauma, from the traumatization he's faced from his father, and he's going to go traumatize other people. <laughs> I mean, that's, but people do this all the time. And also, I really like the fact that this episode also highlighted that American soldier is not an honorable position. It, it just isn't. I'm sorry. We, you can have a com you can have the argument or a conversation down in the comments below if you don't like that I said it. But it really isn't. It's not. It is not. You were going ever since World War II. America has been involved in fighting white supremacist, uh, imperialist wars, wars of <laughs> wars of invasion, of colonization. It has nothing to do with helping people. It has nothing to do with assisting people. It has nothing to do with bringing democracy to the world or freedom to the world it's just about resources about power it's about oppressing other people and to even go and i understand that you know that some black people especially black and poor people black black people who are you know always sort of been poor because of their race and because of racism in america have been made poor and then white poor people they go and they do this thing they go and get the let these army recruiters you know go and you know convince them to go and fight in these wars because essentially they've been left with no other choice they have no access to resources in their own country they're not treated like shit in their own country um they have no access to education in their own country or even if they had access to education they have no access to you know the doors that education is supposed to open because white people control those doors so even to go even if you go get an education you can't walk through those doors into job opportunities into into opportunities for yourself so they leave you America leaves, you know, a certain pe group of people, especially black people, sort of vulnerable, where the only thing they can go do at the end of the day is then go be recruited to go fight in these white supremacist terrorist war, <laughs> terrorist wars. And we've been doing it consistently since after World War II. We have been doing it consistently. And it's really not an honorable thing. And it's, it's not an honorable thing to do. And we there's so much propaganda around like, oh, my goodness, you know, support our troops, support our troops, support what? them going to go oppress and kill and commit genocide against other groups of people what am i so fucking supporting and and most people i have veterans in my family my father is a veteran they will tell you the truth don't go to no fucking war my dad i remember when the i remember when the rec uh, recruiter called me and my dad was like you told him you ain't going right and i was like yeah and i was like yeah i told him i'm not going <laughs> i'm not going and he was like good because you don't need to go nowhere to fight no white man's war because he went there he didn't necessarily have to do any fighting but he drove the trucks and stuff like that he also had to stand guard and stand watch and he said that was one of the scariest nights of his life standing watch and hearing gunfire in the background as he's supposed to sort of guard whatever he after what he, he was supposed to be guarding but hearing gunfire and people yelling and screaming like that was one of the most terrifying nights of his life so any real veteran you know especially black veterans will tell you don't go fight no white man's war it's not an honorable thing to do we did it because we ain't had no other fucking choice there was no other opportunities left for us to have but tick don't even have that excuse under his belt because he wasn't even drafted he wasn't drafted he didn't have to go
I mean, he was still poor, technically. He didn't have a lot of opportunities, sure. So I guess you could still say, sort of, he kind of had to go. Uh, you know, and we also see this back when, you know, even Tick is looking at the recruiter, and back in, you know, season, uh, well, not season one, back in episode one, he's looking at the recruiter, like, you know, he's just looking at him, like, disgusted. The fact that he's getting all these young black men to go and fight some war because he knows how it is. He knows the trauma that it will do to them. Um, but, you know, Tick in this whole entire episode is just trash. He doesn't really see his own his own culpability and sort of oppressing other people he only sees his own oppression and i feel like it was a great critique it was a great critique so we find out that tick's a virgin um when we meet him here in south korea that he hasn't had sex with a woman yet he he opens up to gi essentially and tells her you know before because she's going to plan to kill him um but he tells her i'm not i'm a virgin i've never done this before can we take it slow and all this other stuff and sort of that's when she sort of starts to change and look at him like a little boy and not really like a grown man who knows what he's doing and is very cognizant of what he is doing um and he and she of course tells him to leave tells him to go and then she finds him later and then they build a relationship based off of you know knowing the well sort of the truth about each other not all the truth because she hasn't told him yet that she is <laughs> she has a demon called kimiho or something like that inside her that is the nine tail fox um but she does let him know that of course i was trying to kill you can we start over we've both done monstrous things um and you know let's just start over and essentially he agrees he comes around to it um they have sex for the first time or she you know has sex with him for the first time and the way that i, I just wanted to compare the way that in which that you know gi handles tick versus the way in which tick handles letty when it's her first time of course he doesn't know it's her first time but you know gi really handles tick with a lot of care and a lot of love and compassion that this is his first time and he's kind of nervous and scared and tick just sort of like he doesn't even really care to like <laughs> in so many of their sex scenes he's just so incredibly rough and aggressive and it's no love at all and he's just so still very emotionally detached and like the only time we see tick have sort of this sort of loving like lovingly compassionate and passionate moment with somebody and make love to somebody is when he is with Jiha and not when he is with Letty or anybody else. So I find that disappointing. The fact that we don't get to see black love in that way, that he is so emotionally detached, becomes so emotionally detached because of the trauma, the childhood trauma from his father, because of the trauma from the war and what he had to do. And also the fact that that's eating at him. Um, he just is a he he can't really be fully there for Letty in the way that I think that she needs him to be. Um, but Gi gets that before he actually hardens himself completely. And I also want to compare it to the only sort of loving love scene or making love scene that we've ever gotten is from Uncle George and uh, Aunt Hippolyta. What at the, if you remember at the beginning of episode one, you know they're in bed or whatever, and they're having discussions and they're making love to each other. And that's the only sort of loving scene, loving sex scene that we've ever gotten from out of this whole entire episode. Everybody's kind of rough and aggressive and just sort of like you know grunting and moaning. And then of course this scene right here with Gi and Tick. Um, but we don't really get to see a whole lot of black you know, love making. And I really, I don't know how I feel about that. It makes me a little bit uneasy. I do like the idea and this theme and this paralleling of this idea of the monsters coming alive, like the monsters making, coming in physical form. So the monster of imperialism, the monster of colonial colonialism, um, <laughs> the monster of homophobia, of othering, of sexism, um, you know, all of that is coming alive when we see, you know, sort of, Gi sort of take these men and sort of rip them apart, you know, take their memories, take their souls and sort of rip them apart. Um, she, of course, tries to stop herself with Tick and she throws him off before, you know, the Kamiho can come and grab him. I thought that the way that they did it was very interesting, the way that they show the sort of nine tails sort of wrapping around the person. Um, in Naruto, we sort of see it as this, even though it's sort of this monstrous beast, this nine-tailed fox, it's sort of kind of beautiful in a way, um, the way in which con cartoons usually are. Um, but in this, they really tried to make it as horrifying as possible. At one point, we even see like the eye, like the tails coming out of Gia's eyes and her eyes always sort of pop out to the side for like these like long tails that are kind of like, 
I don't even know what how to describe them, but they're all, they're not even like they don't even look like tails. They look almost like octopus arms and tentacles, kind of. Um, which is but they have hair on them. I guess that's what makes them kind of tail like. And I thought that the gruesomeness, the horrifying nature of it, was really interesting. The way it sort of wraps itself around its victim and tries to squeeze life out of it, I thought was very interesting. I thought that it was also interesting the fact that you know she gets not only past you know images of Tick, but also the future and she actually predicts that he's going to die um tick sort of runs out the room of course after she throws him off and saves him from being consumed and being her hundredth um her hundredth victim you know he sort of runs out of the room and runs away um of course this is all a call back to the last episode and the final scene where tick calls up on south korea calls up jihad asks you know how did you know i was going to die jihad told him and predicted or saw his future that he was going to die i'm assuming it's because she grew a real connection with tick and she fell in love with tick that's why maybe she saw his future instead of the past i don't know i want to i'm interested in seeing how jamie chung's character because jamie chung plays jia in this i'm interested in seeing how how Jamie Chung's character, Jia, you know, unfolds throughout this narrative. Is she's going to come to America? Or if this is sort of an end, if this is her ending, this is kind of whack. <laughs> she needs to come back some at some point and sort of try to, I hope that maybe she'll come back and try to save him at some point or something like that. Um, but I hope that this isn't just like one episode, a one-off episode where we only see, you know, Jia this one time. I also felt like this should have been Korea should have been, I really wish, I do like the fact, the aspect of the fact that we're getting Jiha's perspective and the native Korean people's perspective and how they are viewing the American soldiers versus like just getting the American soldier perspective. But I would have liked to see sort of like from a black person's, from a black male perspective from Tick, what he was facing. Cause it's clear to me that he, the way that which he doesn't even hesitate, the way in which he's called over to sort of execute these women and he just does so point blank period and just like pow. And he doesn't even hesitate. It's almost like a robot. I, he's not even, like, Tick wasn't even recognizable in that moment. I feel like I wanted more backstory. I feel like this episode should have been a two-part episode where we got, you know, Jiha, Jiha's, um perspective and then the one where we got Tick's perspective um, where we get sort of him we get his perspective after he late after he's sort of trying to leave Korea maybe we could have got an episode like that I also felt like these I also kind of feel like I understand that they wanted to sort of make a twist have a twist and a turn so they've trying to get got you to try to love and like fall in love with Tick as a character and then they just sort of hit you with the whammy where Tick is kind of a, like a shitty person himself. I understand that, but I kind of wish that these episodes also were given a little bit sooner. Um, but it seems like next episode, we're going to focus in on Hippolyta, Hippolyta. I think I said last episode that I really wanted to see Hippolyta go on her own adventure, trying to sort of probably save her husband, Uncle George, and go back in time. We sort of already see in the next scene, she's sort of playing with, she's sort of found a way to unlock the key um, to how to get to machine, the machine to work that she found in uh, the Winthrop house um, that has the sort of the solar systems around it, uh, a solar system with two suns. Um, and she, we see her sort of traveling through time. I thought I even see in the preview like a black hole or something there. Um, and like, I, I feel like, so we're going definitely going to be traveling through time. <laughs> we see her in different type of, we see her in different sort of eras already. Um, like the twenties, I think it was. And then at some point we see her in like ancient times or something like that. So I'm really interested in seeing how Hippolyta finally gets her own adventure. Hopefully D, her daughter D, Diana is also in this as well. But let me know what you guys thought about this episode down in the comments section below. Uh, what you thought about the whole episode in terms of the war. Would you have liked to see? like two uh different episodes of this stretch this out into two episodes instead of just trying to you know fit it all into one because i feel like that's what i want i'm not exactly sure what the ending scene of jamie chung and her mother going to jamie chung jiha and her mother going to go see the soothsayer we also see the fox um the representation of the fox which is sort of the representation of the demon inside her um they go and they try to see you know if it is true if you know in fact 
Tick is destined to die. So we sort of, and the soothsayer essentially says, yes, he is destined to die. Um, so it's interest, I'm interested in seeing how this all plays out. Uh, again, they hit us with another sort of, they threw another wrench in sort of this whole <laughs> series and this whole sort of plot line that now Tick is destined to die. So we'll see if he actually does die. We'll see how it all plays out. Let me know what you think in the comments section below. Um, thoughts that you had, you know, uh, things that I didn't possibly miss or didn't hit on. Um, and hopefully next week I'll be back um, to not doing this in the car video form, but in my living room again. Um, but I'll see you all next time for the next video. And that'll be it.